five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. This is about space. America's return to space with news and information on our U.S. space program is your host of About Space, David Denault. Welcome and thanks for joining me today. Well, recently I came across an article about the city of Sodom. Now, it's believed that a giant space rock demolished an ancient Middle Eastern city and everyone in it, possibly inspiring the biblical story of Sodom some 3,600 years ago. Archaeologist Dr. Stephen Collins says they have discovered this ancient site. I'll have details next as America and the world is listening to About Space today. About Space invites you to be our guest for the next SpaceX Crew 3 launch on Sunday, October the 31st. Be our guest with overnight lodging at the Best Western on Cocoa Beach with a full breakfast and all the amenities at the Oceanfront Hotel, plus two tickets to see the Kennedy Space Center. So come be our guest. Just go to our special website, aboutspacetoday.godaddysites.com. That's aboutspacetoday.godaddysites.com and enter today and be our guest for the next manned SpaceX launch. Welcome back. Dr. Stephen Collins is the executive curator of the Museum of Archaeology and Biblical History and dean of the College of Archaeology and Biblical History at Trinity Southwestern University. Listen as Dr. Collins shares his step-by-step scientific and biblical discoveries in finding Sodom. And let's not forget that Genesis itself is the most doubted book in the Bible. It's the most challenged, the most doubted book in the Bible. Stories like this, like Sodom and Gomorrah and fire out of the sky where God destroys an entire civilization in the blink of an eye, these things are not believed by most scholars. But if we can confirm it archaeologically, scientifically, then we can have a powerful confirmation that the biblical record that we have is factual. So we've got 12 years of scientific research, exploration, and excavation on this subject, and I believe we're finally setting the record straight, not only on the location of the cities, but the factuality of the story itself. But that doesn't mean that there aren't some liberal scholars, uh, we call them minimalists, that they believe the minimal amount of the Bible they can get away with. Um, Minimalists still reject the idea that these stories could be true. Um, Here's one, uh, Dr. William Deaver, who, by the way, I've had to Albuquerque to speak to my students several times. Uh, He's a great guy. We really enjoy one another. Um, We have some good conversations, but he does not believe the cities ever existed. This this is a quotation he aimed at me uh, on the front page of the Wall Street Journal a few years ago about our project. He said, no responsible scholar goes out with a trowel in one hand and a Bible in the other. Yikes. You know, I don't like being called, do you like being called irresponsible? Uh, No, I don't either. And I didn't appreciate that a whole lot. But uh, here's my basic response to him. Well, no responsible scholar goes digging in the Holy Land without a trowel in one hand and a Bible in the other. (laughs) And I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. The reason is simply because, bottom line, the Bible is still the best, the most comprehensive historical and geographical document or set of documents we have preserved from the ancient world. Period. End of discussion. Okay, it's still the best. So not to use it would be borderline crazy. All right, so we have to have it. Now, the stories comprising the text of Genesis are what I call serial geographies. That is, they take us from place to place to place to place. Now, a lot of scholars have overlooked this fact. Ancient Near Eastern writers, whether they be Bible writers or whether they're Babylonians, Egyptians, Hittites, or Bible writers, whoever they are, they do not invent fictitious geographies. There's no such thing as Middle Earth or Five Acre Wood in ancient writing, okay? 
everything they tell us, whether the stories themselves are fact or fiction, the stories are layered over a real world geography. They are not mythical constructs, and the Bible geography has no mythical geography, and that includes the stories of Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities of the plain as they are generally known. Now, if you don't take the Bible seriously and you don't read the text carefully, then um, you're not going to take advantage of all of that information and you're going to wind up in the wrong place. When we're talking about locating Sodom, I often capsule, encapsulate it in three things. Right place, right time, right stuff. You can get those three things right. Right place, right time, right stuff. If we do those things, we ought to be able to find it. Now, what's the right place? I mentioned Genesis chapter 13, and the reason we mention that is that is the principal biblical text that gives us the location, the map, to go to Sodom. It was specifically written to take us to the city of Sodom. In fact, this is the only narrative passage we have in the entire Bible that is specifically written for the purpose of taking us to the location of Sodom and Gomorrah. There is not another one. So you get far enough away from the river that you don't suffer that every spring. So Sodom and Gomorrah cannot be in the Dead Sea Valley as most people place them, but it has to be north of the Dead Sea. Um, and Tal El Hammam, there is a huge archeological site sitting at that location that had never been paid attention to before. Uh, very interesting. Tal Hamam, and you can see the area around it, it looks like the well-watered plain of the Jordan. They're growing banana trees there today, all kinds of crops. And this is the best agricultural land in the region. The site has the early Bronze Age. It also has the intermediate Bronze Age and the middle Bronze Age, matching all the biblical periods in which the site is mentioned. That's the right chronology. So everything is there chronologically, not only geographically. But you know, with all of that, what everybody really wants to know is, how bad was the destruction? Archaeologists estimated the space rock was traveling about 38,000 miles per hour with an impact of 1,000 times more power than the Hiroshima atomic bomb. And with temperatures rising above 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit or 2,000 degrees Celsius, with massive shockwaves smashing into the city moving about 740 miles per hour. None of the 8,000 people, or any animals, survived. Listen next week as Dr. Collin uncovers the horrific meltdown of the city. Be sure to listen next week with me on Tuesday, and on Friday, America in Space with Don Meyer from Florida's Space Coast. And follow us on Facebook for space news updates at aboutspace.today. And our Tuesday shout-out goes to Russia, with its many listeners who enjoy our weekly programs. And to all our friends and listeners around the globe and here in the U.S., thank you for listening. I'm David Denault, and this has been About Space Today.